first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Tony Mackay and I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Social Sciences. And it's my great pleasure tonight to be able to welcome all of you here and to be able to chair with, uh, what I'm sure will be a very interesting lecture. I would first of all just like to acknowledge uh, and to honour the ancestral lands of the Ngunnawal people. Uh, I acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of this continent whose cultures are among the oldest living cultures in human history. I pay respects to the elders of the community and extend my recognition to their descendants who are present. I'd also like to acknowledge the many uh, different guests that we have here today, in particular uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the parliament and also uh, from the embassies. Today, um, Amin Cycle is going to talk to us about Egypt, uh, uh, Mubarak's legacy and its implications. And Amin Cycle is a professor of political science and director of the Centre for Arabic and Islamic Studies, the Middle East and Central Asia, uh, here at the Australian National University. He has had a very distinguished academic career. He's been a visiting fellow at Princeton University, Cambridge University, the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, as well as a Rockefeller Foundation Fellow in International Relations from 1983 to 1988. He's also, in recognition of his work to the international community, as well as to education as an advisor and author, he was awarded the Order of Australia in January 2006. He has been the author of numerous works on the Middle East, Central Asia and Russia. And just to give you an idea of the type of work that he's done over quite a long period of time, he's had uh, the following major publications. Islamism, the Iranian Revolution and the Soviet Invasion of Afghanistan, which was published in Cambridge History of the Cold War just recently in 2010. In 2009, the rise and fall of the Shah, Iran from autocracy to religious rule. In 2006, modern Afghanistan, a history of struggle and survival. And in 2003, Islam and the West, conflict or cooperation. In addition to all of that, he's also published many op-ed pieces in a number of national and international dailies, including the International Herald Tribune, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times and The Guardian. And as I'm sure for many of you, you're aware that he has been a frequent commentator on issues related to the Middle East and Central Asia on radio and television. Not only has Amin done all of that, he's also been the foundation director of the Centre of Arabic and Islamic Studies that I just referred to. It is a key and very valued centre in the Research School of Social Sciences in our college. It was established in 1994 and it is now the largest and most distinguished of its kind in Australia. And much of that is due to the incredible energy uh, and enthusiasm and depth of knowledge that Amin has brought to the centre as its director. It enjoys high international standing <coughs> has links with its major counterparts in the Arab and Muslim world, as well as in North America, Europe and Asia. <coughs> it is indeed a centre of excellence in teaching and research in relation to Islam and the politics, modern history, culture, political economy, business, international relations, as well as languages of the Muslim Middle East and Central Asia. So the centre provides both educational programs at undergraduate and postgraduate, and it also does important and very valuable research in this area. It has also provided a pool of expertise for the public and private sectors, uh, as well as commenting in, in the media, but also in strengthening Australia's ties with the Middle East, Eastern and Central Asian dom domains through both educational links and engagement with government, business, diplomatic missions and the broader community. And I can't think of anybody else at the ANU, but in Australia, uh, who could talk to us at what is on a topic of what is 
of very topical interest uh, at the moment. Amen. Thanks very much, Tony, for that very generous uh, introduction. And I uh, thank Tony and the uh, College of Arts and Social Sciences for the valuable support that they've provided us, and uh, not only uh, for a centre, but also personally for me. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my brief this uh, afternoon is to speak uh, uh, on Egypt, Mubarak's legacy and its implications. Uh, Egypt, the land of the pharaohs, with a long history of civilization and systems of governance, is on the verge of long-term structural change. The process may prove to be turbulent, arduous, and painful, but at the end, a new pluralist and participatory order is most likely to emerge, with a serious impact on the Middle Eastern geopolitical landscape. In the face of an unprecedented spontaneous public uprising in the modern history of Egypt, the three-decade-long Western-backed authoritarian rule of President Hosni Mubarak is set to end by September 2011, if not earlier. Based on a continuous state of emergency and political repression, his rule has delivered Egypt a long period of peace and security but at the cost of democratic reforms, equitable socio-economic development, and a dynamic foreign policy, which had once primed Egypt as a critical actor in the region and beyond. Mubarak has lost his legitimacy at home and credibility abroad. All he's trying to do now is secure a somewhat graceful exit and thus avoid the fate of two previous Western-backed Middle Eastern autocrats the Shah of Iran, and Zainal Abedin bin Ali of Tunisia, who were driven out of their countries in, in humiliation by their people 30 years and three weeks ago, respectively. Whatever Mubarak's fate, he is no history as far as I am concerned. But the Egyptian people face difficult choices and priorities, fraught with unpredictable developments and managing their country's transition. This also confronts the United States and its allies, and Israel in particular, with serious quandaries. As for the other authoritarian Arab regimes, the Egyptian uprising must once again demonstrate to them that ultimately there is no reward in hanging on to power through dictatorial means. Following the toppling of Bin Ali in Tunisia, on 14th of January, the head of the Arab League in Egypt's former foreign minister, Amr Musa, said, the Arab soul is broken. Speaking at an Arab economic summit in Egypt, he blamed poverty, unemployment, and general recession. He stated that the Tunisian revolution is not far from us, and warned that the Arab citizens have entered an unprecedented a state of anger and frustration, which could only be addressed by an Arab renaissance. He could not put it more aptly, except that as a seasoned diplomat, he refrained from mentioning political repression as another central reason of which most of the leaders around the table were guilty. The 82-year-old Mubarak was among those leaders, but he appeared so confident of his rule that he did not make reference to the Tunisian revolution, let alone digest Amr Musa's warning. However, he has played an important part in that breaking of the Arab soul, which has now caught up with him in a way that could easily blot his 30 years at the helm of Egyptian power and politics. The question is, can the Egyptian people and their fellow Arabs rebuild the Arab soul and assume a critical voice that they deserve in world politics. After assuming power in the wake of President Anwar al-Sadat's assassination in 1981 by a member of a Muslim extremist group who was op opposed to Sadat's 1979 peace treaty with Israel, Mubarak set out to rule by a state of emergency under law number 162, which extends police powers, legitimizes censorship, 
and suspends constitutional rights. Contrary to promising a kinder and gentler government, he strengthened the authoritarian system of party bureaucratic security governance, which had been established to a large extent under his two predecessors, Sadat and Jamal Abdel Nasser, who overthrew Egypt's pro-British monarchy and declared the country an Arab nationalist republic in 1952. Mubarak stubbornly refused to recognize that such a model has always been doomed to failure and has resulted in political and socio-economic stagnation and foreign policy debacles. He expanded the powers of the Interior Ministry and intel Intelligence Services, which routinely engaged in torture and human rights violations as a means of rule enforcement. In 2010, various sources argued that the number of Egyptian political prisoners ranged from 15,000 to 30,000. Like all autocrats, Mubarak became increasingly self-centered, all-knowing, and delusional, thinking that he was the only person capable of leading Egypt. He found it both threatening and self-degrading to even appoint a vice, a vice president. While amending the constitution of 1971, he empowered himself over the years as the sole arbiter of the Egyptian polity. All forms of political dissent, whether secular or religious, were suppressed under him. And he put the Egyptian public and the international community on warning that the alternative to his regime would be an Islamic fundamentalist takeover, led by the oldest counter-systemic movement, the banned Muslim Brotherhood. The presidential and parliamentary elections that he staged were farcical, with Mubarak as the only presidential candidate. A flawed electoral system enabled his ruling National Democratic Party to claim overwhelming victory election after election. For all intents and purposes, Egypt became a one-party state. The secularist nationalist Waft Party, which was the most popular liberal political force during the two world wars, has gradually declined from 1952 into insignificance. The Muslim Brotherhood, founded in 1928, was subjected to severe suppression. Although the group had been banned under Nasser and Sadat, Mubarak launched a systemic, systematic campaign to present it as a major Islamist menace to Egypt and beyond. He progressively felt so threatened by the growing popularity and organizational strength of the Brotherhood that he left his security forces unrestrained in targeting the group with frequently interning and harassing its leaders and members. Even so, the group is still managed to field candidates as independents in the parliamentary elections since 1984, with a major triumph in 2005 when it won 88 seats in a 518-seat parliament. However, in the 2010 parliamentary elections, the government made sure, through intimidation and fraud, that the Brotherhood did not win a single seat. The elections attracted widespread international condemnation. Mubarak's performance on the economic and social fronts produced some good results, but could not compensate for his iron fist approach to governance. His policies nurtured a rich and corrupt governing elite and a weak but nonetheless burgeoning middle class. Yet, they did little to improve the lot of a great majority of the impoverished Egyptian masses. After pursuing more or less the old Nasserite policies of centralization during the 1980s, from 1991 on, he largely embraced international monetary fund and internationally sponsored reforms aimed at attracting foreign direct investment, which he accelerated from 2004. This helped produce a promising period of economic growth, entailing wider social changes and awareness. Between 2004 and 2009, Egypt's GDP grew from $1,041 to $2,270. I'm sorry, from his GDP from $1,041 billion to 
$2,270 billion. And per capita income, taking into account purchasing power parity, from $4,000 to $4,900. However, given the nature of Mubarak's rule and its inherent anomalies, including favoring big businesses and privatization over workers' rights, the growth largely benefited the ruling elite, which came to own most of the nation's wealth. It did not result in a degree of social and economic development and wealth redistribution that could satisfy the middle class and help the poor strata of the society to lead themselves out of poverty in both the slums of the urban centers, especially Cairo, and in the rural areas. Meanwhile, Egypt's imports exceeded its exports by a large margin, and its external debt grew to about 20 to 30 percent of its GDP, or around 33 billion dollars in 2010. From 2008, Egypt was also affected by the global financial crisis, which shrank its public and private sector activities to a noticeable extent. In 2009, Egypt's GDP growth rate dropped from 7% in 2008 to 5% in 2009. Foreign direct, direct investment diminished by 40%, unemployment reached an estimated 30% and inflation some 30%, although the official figures told a different story. Economic growth and national productivity simply could not keep pace with Egypt's rapidly rising population, growing from some 50 million in the early 1980s to more than 83 million in 2010. From 2005 to 2010, the percentage of Egyptians that considered themselves as thriving with a positive view towards their current life situation and the future fell from 29% to 11%. An outcome of the rapid population growth has been serious demographic changes. Today, some 70% of Egyptians are under the age of 30. As more people graduate from upper secondary and tertiary education institutions, there has not been sufficient and relevant employment opportunities, and democratic safety valves in terms of greater participation to divert them from becoming more frustrated with and alienated from Mubarak's leadership. Mubarak seemed to be insensitive to the growth of gulf between the ruler and the ruled and between the state and society. <coughs> to a majority of the Egyptian public, all he seemed to care about was himself, his family, and his ruling apparatus, with a burning desire to crown his son, Jamal, to succeed him, and thus transform Egypt into a republican monarchy. In foreign policy, he could not carry many Egyptians with him either. He religiously upheld Egypt's peace treaty with Israel, and strengthened the country's ties as a loyal ally with the United States. He considered both as critical aids to his rule. Peace with Israel meant not only being free of any costly conflict, but also more financial and military kudos from the United States. America's roughly $2 billion assistance per year proved to be critical for him to keep his military and security brass, as well as key administrative personnel content. He publicly supported the right of the Palestinians to an independent state of their own and opposed expansion of Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories. However, he balanced this with a quiet policy approach that assisted Israel in playing off the Fatah-led Palestinian Authority, which has been in charge of the West Bank, against the Islamist Hamas, which has controlled Gaza Strip since the middle of 2007. And he also assisted Israel in enforcing an illegal blockade and collective punishment of the people of Gaza in order to undermine the rule of Hamas as quote unquote terrorist organization. Like Israel and its international supporters, he chose to overlook the fact that Hamas won the January 2006 Palestinian general elections democratically. Beyond this, he concurred with Jerusalem, Washington, and London on Israel's devastating 
do unsuccessful military campaign against Lebanon in order to destroy the Iranian and Syrian-backed Hezbollah in 2006. He certainly opposed the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq, but fully cooperated with the Bush administration on rendition and torture. In all this, he sided with the conservative Arab forces and dampened the Nasser's policy of Arab nationalism even more than Sadat had done. Yet for all this, he achieved nothing as far as a viable and lasting settlement of the Palestinian problem is concerned. He could not move Israel an inch towards withdrawing to its pre-1967 border in order to allow the creation of an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. This left him extremely vulnerable to a strong view among many Egyptians that he was pro-Israel Israel and pro-American, more to maintain his power than anything else. According to various public opinion surveys, the bulk of young Egyptians increasingly found his policy behavior affronting, and a good number of old Egyptians felt it demeaned over their country losing the leadership that it had once enjoyed in the Arab world. They were also progressively troubled by the fact that three non-Arab states, Israel, Iran, and Turkey, had come to be far more influential players than Egypt in shaping regional politics. Certain parallels between the Iranian revolution of 1978 and 1979 and the current Egyptian uprising are inescapable. The Egyptian development can be viewed as almost a carbon copy of the Iranian revolution. Like the Iranian revolution, the Egyptian phenomenon commenced spontaneously without any specific group or individuals leading it, and has targeted a Western-backed ruler whose autocratic leadership and policy behavior have generated the kinds of conditions that the people can no longer endure. It took the Iranian people 25 years to marshal their energy against the Shah. And the same has now more or less come true with the Egyptians. It is often argued that the Shiite Muslims are more prone to uprising against their rulers than the Sunni Muslims. The Egyptian case, and for that matter, the Tunisian revolution, have proven that the Sunni-Shiite divide makes no difference when a large cross-section of the ruled are alienated from and frustrated with their rulers. As it was the case with the Shah, Mubarak leaves an Egypt that has had no tradition of vibrant democracy and no necessary foundations, such as an appropriate legal rational framework, civil society, separation of powers, free press and media, an independent judiciary that could easily facilitate its transition to a democracy. In this kind of situation, there is always the risk of a power vacuum being created that a well-organized group with a culturally and socially relevant ideological agenda can, still, can fill and divert the revolution from its original goal. This is what precisely happened in Iran, enabling the charismatic, popular and politically shrewd Ayatollah Khomeini and his supporters to seize the leadership of the revolution and transform it from an anti-Shah revolution and pursuit of democratic reforms into an Islamic one in order to institute a theocratic order with an anti-US and, and anti-Israeli posture. Khomeini drew on the anger of the Iranian people over America's support for the Shah the Shah's close relationship with Israel and America's unqualified backing of Israel to achieve his Islamist objectives. Washington's failure to back away from the Shah's rule until the 11th hour and to support the democratic forces which had initially spearheaded the revolution played an important part in helping Khomeini and his supporters to triumph and in sowing the seeds of a US-Iranian hostility that continues to the present day at much anxiety for Washington and Jerusalem. In a similar vein, the Egyptian revolution also remains quite vulnerable to a takeover by a group, especially if the crisis lingers for too long, as it did in the case of the Iranian revolt. The Muslim Brotherhood is often touted 
as the best organized and most popular movement with a capacity to take advantage of the current disorder. However, this is not a scenario that could easily come about. The Brotherhood is not in, a, in as favorable a position as Khomeini's Islamists were in Iran. Despite all the fuss made about it by the Mubarak leadership, the Brotherhood is a divided and relatively small movement. It is made up of a spectrum of Islamists ranging from radicals to conservative pragmatists and moderates, with the latter two categories constituting possibly the bulk of its membership. As such, it's divided into various factions, with no charismatic and popular leader like Khomeini to command them as a united front. As for its size, in the absence of any reliable figures, one estimate puts, it, puts its membership at about 100,000 although a more reasonable figure might be around 200,000. Whatever the size of its membership and overall influence among the public, it does not currently possess the necessary standing to act as the dominant political force within Egyptian society, which partly explains why it has not played a leading role in the current uprising. But those opportunities appear to be very limited at this stage, and the chances of the Brotherhood leading Egypt down the path of a radical Islamist transformation are indeed fairly slim, unless the current ruling National Democratic Party totally disintegrates, as my very good friend and a well-known expert on Egypt, Professor Robert Barker, has pointed out. It must be noted that Egypt is not an entirely Muslim country. It has a substantial Coptic Christian minority forming about 10% of its population. In this sense, the country resembles Indonesia. Many Copts have supported the opposition to Mubarak, but they would not be receptive to a Muslim Brotherhood takeover. The Egyptian situation remains very fluid and unpredictable at this stage, but one can envisage three scenarios as possibilities. The first is, that Mubarak's newly appointed Vice President Omar Suleiman will continue the dialogue that he has started with representatives of various opposition groups, including the Muslim Brotherhood and what is called a group of wise men, with a view to enabling Mubarak to stay in power as a figurehead until September, and also to take the sting out of the public protest and institute a transitional process. However, so far, Suleiman has not gone far enough in his concessions, either to satisfy the protesters in the Tahrir Square or gain the confidence of those with whom he has been negotiating. The opposition remains highly skeptical of Suleiman. Given his past unsavory record as chief of Egyptian intelligence and the WikiLeaks' latest disclosure that he is Israel's favorite, favorite to succeed Mubarak. Yet, the door remains open to further negotiations. The outcome will depend very much on whether the protesters can maintain their rage and keep reinforcing their demand that Mubarak must relinquish power immediately. Although at this stage, they remain very firm in their determination, if by any chance they, that's the protesters, weaken and lose, mo lose momentum, something on which the regime is counting, then Suleiman, Suleiman could gain the upper hand and institute a kind of transition to pluralist politics which would not seriously disadvantage all those forces which have a vested interest in Mubarak's regime. The second scenario is that there is no accommodation between the regime and the opposition. This will leave the regime with two options. One is to declare martial law, to which Suleiman has hinted, provided that it can still command the loyalty of the armed forces, whose role has so far been double-edged in the crisis. On the one hand, the military has assured the protesters that it will not fire on them. On the other hand, it has remained closely tied to the regime, with a call on the protesters to go home in the wake of Mubarak's declaration that neither he nor his son will run in the September presidential elections. Of course, such a measure 
cannot be a solution to the crisis and acceptable to the international community, including the United States. The Shah imposed such a me measure to no avail. The other option is for the regime to accede to the demands of the opposition and set up a transitional government headed by someone acceptable to a cross-section of the Egyptian society to put Egypt on a path of democratization. Such a government would need to change the constitution, adopt a new electoral law, create an independent judiciary, separate capital from politics, and generate a vibrant civil society as the institutional foundations for holding fair and free elections within a year. At present, there is no single person with such a national stature to lead a transitional government. However, two figures who have the necessary qualities and comes immediately to mind to act as nationally unifying and acceptable persons to a considerable extent are Amr Musa, the current Arab League Secretary General, and the former head of the International Atomic Energy Agency and Nobel laureate, Dr. Mohammed al baradai Although al baradai does not have a record of long service in Egypt, he has been at the forefront of the present protests and holds a more impeccable reputation than that of Amri Musa, who served as Mubarak's foreign minister for many years. Under the circumstances, even some prominent elements in the Muslim Brotherhood have suggested that one of these two individuals may be acceptable to them to lead a transitional government. The third scenario is that neither side gives in to the crisis to open the way for a viable resolution. In this case, Egypt could easily slide into a state of perpetual conflict, violence and bloodshed, with its economy in tatters and status structures weakening or even crumbling. This is not what the secularist opposition forces want and it is not something that would serve the interests of the ruling elite either. But it could widen opportunities for a Muslim Brotherhood, especially its radical faction, to gain more ground. Egypt is a pivotal Arab state, with a substantial pool of trained manpower and non-human resources, as well, uh, as well as a large but conscripted army, whose backing has been critical for Mubarak's rule. The present crisis is set to deliver a political order very different from what the Egyptians have experienced since 1952. For the new order to work, it will have to be pluralist and popularly legitimated. By the same token, Egypt cannot be expected to pursue the same foreign policy goals and priorities as before. With so much public dissatisfaction over Mubarak's relations with Israel and the United States, the new Egyptian government may well find it imperative to rationalize these, these relations to the extent necessary to satisfy various political forces, including the Muslim Brotherhood, which has opposed Egypt's peace treaty with Israel and close ties with the United States, whose support would be necessary for the workability and legitimacy of this government. Egypt's developments are set to reverberate throughout the Arab world and change the regional geopolitical political status quo. If not managed smoothly and prudently, these developments could provide an unprecedented boost to secular and religious opposition in the fellow Arab countries and strengthen further the position of anti-status anti quo forces. Most importantly, the Iranian Islamic regime and its sub-national allies in Iraq and Lebanon in particular. They could equally leave Israel regretful over having not acted seriously in pursuit of reaching a viable settlement with the Palestinians while Mubarak was in power. The Arab countries where authoritarian regimes are at risk most are Yemen, Jordan, Algeria, and Morocco. However, at this stage, the same cannot be said about the Gulf Arab states, largely because they have substantial oil larges with the small populations that they could easily control, especially with help from a considerable US military and security presence on their soil. 
Even the largest state among them, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, appears to be quite immune for these reasons and for its demographic spread. Libya also falls within this category to a considerable extent. Syria is in a position of its own. Its continued opposition to Israel and strategic partnership with Iran, as well as long period of fairly deep secularization, may well cushion Bashar al-Assad's regime against serious uprising. However, from this point, none of them can afford to be complacent about their rule without engaging in reform to close the gap between them and their citizens. The Obama administration has obviously recognized the significance of the Egyptian uprising and its implications. Hence, its emphasis on reform in meeting the aspirations of the Egyptian people and not going back to what had existed prior to the present crisis. In this, Obama has acted more shrewdly than the Carter administration did in relation to the Iranian revolution. However, the challenge will be whether Washington and its allies, more specifically Israel, will be ready to embrace any outcome if it is going to be a result of democratic processes and whether they will support similar developments to take roots in other Arab states. The United States and its allies do not have a solid record in this respect. and therefore do not inspire much confidence in their ability to manage this, the current crisis. They refuse to recognize the outcome of the Palestinians' democratic elections of January 2006 and sided with Israel in punishing the Palestinian people and the party, that's Hamas, for which they voted. Thank you very much. I mean, we've got about 20 to 25 minutes for any questions that people might like to ask. So who'd like to ask the first question? Um, Professor Sain, thank you very much for a very clear overview and, and clear analysis. Um, you mentioned the role of the army in the environment sort of sitting on the fence somewhat. But could you see a fourth scenario possibly where the army uh, actually stages a, a group and then it should take over and resolves the crisis currently that way? Well, I mean, as I pointed out, one of the options is for a military to take over. But that's not really going to be a solution to the crisis. This is a, a serious political crisis. And we have had examples of that in history, that military takeover may have provided a respite, but certainly not a long-term solution to the problem. So Egypt will still be, uh, be in a very, very difficult uh, situation. Um, and uh, therefore, I, for one, would not be in favor of a military takeover, no matter for how long, even if it's going to be for a year. And also, we must remember that Egypt is not Turkey. We've had this experience with Turkey, that the military has taken over, but within a year or two or three years, handed over power to the civilian government. But they've pulled the strings you know, from behind the scenes. And of course, we've known about the, super, uh, about the position of the military in Pakistan, uh, which uh, even when it's not been in power, I mean, for half of Pakistan's life, in fact, they have directly uh, governed Pakistan. But the period that they have not really governed Pakistan directly, they have still been the main force behind any civilian governments, which have limited the ability of those governments to lead their countries down the path of democratic transformations and therefore long-term viability. Thank you, Ambassador Jordan. I want to thank uh, Dr. Seifan for his uh, lecture. Uh, I have an intervention because you've mentioned my country uh, in the course of your lecture. And you included Jordan with uh, some other uh, countries in the region. I would like to differentiate. There's a big difference. Uh, there. Uh, in Jordan, we do have economic realities and hardships, uh, mainly due uh, to the rise of uh, food and oil uh, prices in the world. Uh, Jordan is not immune from uh, the current world uh, economic crisis. 
but we need to differentiate between economic hardships and political uh, stability. We have political st stability, and all the countries you've mentioned, Egypt, Tunis, and the rest of the other countries you've included us with, are republics. Uh, we are a democratic monarchy. All of the um, demonstrations that took to the streets in the above mentioned countries, they were asking for their presidents to go. Ours was not. Ours were uh, um, two rallies that took place in January, requesting and asking the king for the ousting of the government, not the monarch himself, and asking for better conditions, financial conditions, and uh, social and economic reforms. So uh, I don't think it's, um, uh, it's fair for you to include Jordan in this, in this uh, uh, category, uh, mind you. Uh, today we have formed our new government, and uh, um, uh, now the um, uh, reactions are uh, quite, quite positive from the um, uh, social, uh, all social walks of life, and uh, uh, we have to wait and see. So I don't think it's fair by all means to include Jordan in this equation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that comment. And uh, I didn't mean, and I didn't have time, I didn't want to go over time to really explain each country separately. Uh, of course, there are differences between uh, Jordan, and Egypt, and Tunisia, and, and you know, like other countries which are really ex are experiencing, including Yemen, which are experiencing uh, uh, um, uh, popular uh, protests at the moment in one form or another. Um, and I do acknowledge that, yes, uh, King Abdullah II has already um, appointed a new prime minister, and hopefully the new government will steer Jordan uh, more towards democratic reforms than has been the case uh, in the past. Uh, but that's not to say that Jordan is not in danger. Uh, Jordan is in danger in the sense that if, God, if, if, if it all depends how the situation is going to develop in Egypt. And Jordan also has a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, Jordan also has, has been, uh, uh, some people would argue, complacent in the process of what is really going on uh, in the West Bank and what has been really going on in the Gaza and so on. And of course, we also know that a substantial uh, pop, uh, part of the population of Jordan, you are of Palestinian origins, and you do have very deep sympathy uh, for the Palestinians in the, in the West Bank. Yes. And, and, and my, my, my feeling is that these factors could easily come into play into the popular imagination and therefore really cause more disturbances in Jordan than perhaps we've experienced uh, that far. But at the same time, my hope is that King Abdullah will manage the process uh, more effectively than perhaps uh, either President Mubarak or, for that matter, any other Arab leaders have been able to do, to, to, uh, to do it uh, so far. But, of course, it is true that you know, Jordan is a monarchy, and monarchy is a very strong tradition in uh, Jordan and so on. But at the same time, there are forces at work which could possibly result in destabilization, but will depend on how the situation is managed at the moment. Thank you, Professor, for your very comprehensive uh, uh, speech. I am from Mauritius, and Mauritius has been affected to a certain extent by what is happening in, your camp, uh, in Egypt. We had to close our embassy, and uh, well, we hope that when the situation returns to normalcy, we will go back there. Now, uh, not only Mauritius, almost all the countries in the world are being affected, and you see the price of oil is going up because there are some yes, the price of oil and the impact that we have on world economy. Now, I, I am thinking aloud. 30 years in power is too long. This is, <laughs> and this is the problem with Africa. You see, what, is, what has happened in Zimbabwe, what is happening now in uh, Egypt, the problem when we inherited constitutions, there was no question of term limit. And this is one of the biggest, <coughs> I won't say failures, mistakes, or the biggest missing point here is that there should have been a provision in the constitution that there should be no more than two terms. And this has worked in South Africa. We have seen President Tabo and Mickey. Well, President uh, Nelson Mandela, he was magnanimous. 
be less powerful and great. We have never seen that in Africa. But President Tabo and Miki, we have seen, because of the constitutional limit, he could not go. And then we have a new president, and now, in the beginning, they were saying, OK, South Africa will go down the grid, but what has happened? Nothing. Instead, the economy of South Africa and the run has gone up. So my, uh, my question to you, uh, Professor, what is your assessment if President Obama goes, you know, a, a dignified exit, all party conference comes into play, and try to bring a new constitution or to bring an amendment to the existing constitution with this constitutional limit to president? Well, I think that is important, and I think constitutional limits will have to be on the rulers or on the, uh, on the leaders. Um, and uh, one of the things which has become a very common joke in the Arab world is that uh, uh, the leaders there rule by kursi. That is, you know, that they come to power and they hold on to their chariots, you know, for, for as long as possible. Then at the end, they either die in those chairs or they're deposed or driven out of their country. And, and, that, and that's been the sort of a fairly common feature of political life in that part of the world. So the next Egyptian constitution was going to come into existence, uh, or whether the current you know, constitution is going to be modified, then it will have to really include a clause of that nature. Um, and I must really say that uh, some people now claim that perhaps uh, in Central Asia and in the Middle East there are only uh, uh, three democracies. Uh, Israel, um, Iraq, and Afghanistan. But let me put then, at least in relation to Afghanistan, that it, it, is, it, it, it is not a kind of democracy that perhaps a majority of the Afghan people could enjoy and could really embrace. I mean, there is also no uh, constitution limits on the terms of the president. And the president is in a position to modify the constitution if he wishes to do so in order to stay in perpetuity. So that, even there, there is a great deal of Danger. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your, um, for your presentation. My question is, I think it, it might be an understatement to say that many people in the Middle East, especially Egypt, would be slightly frustrated towards the West, on one hand promoting democracy, but on the other hand supporting dictators like Osman and Mubarak. So my question is, if there is a democracy in Egypt in the near future, and not from I'm not sure about the Muslim Brotherhood, but a government that really is representative of the average Egyptian comes into power. Do you think that the foreign policy of that government towards the West will be will, will be pragmatic, or do you think it will it will be aggressive like Iran? I think it's most likely to be pragmatic. I mean, you know, Egypt in many ways is different from Iran and the Egyptian people, their character, and their culture. So, um, yeah, they're, they're very different from. Uh, uh, Iranians in, 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 in that respect. Um, but whatever government comes into existence after the current regime, um, it will have to respond to the composition of that government, which is going to be a coalition government. I don't think there's going to be a single force which will be in a position to take over the government in, in, in Egypt. Uh, and therefore, the, it will be composed of various elements. And the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, whether the international community likes it or not, is going to be a player. And this government will have to respond to some of the demands of the um, Muslim Brotherhood. And one of the things that the Muslim Brotherhood wants is rationalization of its relations with Israel and the United States. It really doesn't want the, uh, the, uh, the, gov the, the, the new government to conduct business uh, as usual. And, 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 and I think for that reason, I expect the foreign policy of the post-Mubarak government would need to be somewhat very different. But that is not to say that you're not going to be pragmatic. Even the Iranian regime, which we all feel is terribly ideological, well, not really. They're only using ideology whenever it really suits them. But beyond that, they are very pragmatic. They know what they are precisely doing. They, uh, they, are, they are into the business of regime preservation. They are into the, uh, 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 the business of leadership preservation. And, and they do engage in all sorts of political games in order to achieve 
the subjective. So I would imagine, uh, and I would expect, that a government coming to power in Egypt would have to exercise pragmatism on the one hand and respond to the needs of a coalition or an alliance of forces which would form that government. I mean, we are facing it at the moment in Australia. I mean, our government is a coalition government. It's a minority government with the support of the independents. And we know that how much they have given to the independents in order to maintain that government. So the same sort of thing could be applicable to a post mubarak government in Egypt. Thank you, Professor. Well, I, I was born in Egypt, and uh, I'm not 30 years old yet, and I'm going to see my president, and it seems very soon I'll lose You're very young. <laughs> it seems very soon I'll lose, I'll lose one word in my vocabulary I've never used, the word ex-president, you know? So, <laughs> something very, very good. Mm -hmm. I, I just would like to, uh, I guess, I, I'm not obviously in the administration, I'd like to bring the feeling of what's happening there. Uh, I've been calling and contacting families and, and, and friends. They're all excited. They're all excited. This, this is a moment that they never thought that they would experience in their lifetime. Uh, some thought that they would die before Mubarak. I myself thought I would die before Mubarak. And, <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's, it's very good feelings. The regime has hijacked history for its own purposes. I hijacked our civilization. The regime has hijacked science, culture, Cinema, everything, all science and art they had, they were used to serve the regime. And suddenly people are becoming, you know, expressive about the, their thoughts. Now, my question, the Professor, do you think that the uprisings, you know, which is mainly, you know, frustrated by the useful Egyptians, will give sort of like a warning to any future regimes that behave yourself. Otherwise, the Egyptians can do a lot. Whether, it, whether it's going to be the Muslim Brotherhood or the army, whatever sort of regime that's going to misbehave, do you think that this uprising will sort of sit, you know, a precedent for any future regime? Well, this was really the hope in the wake of the Iranian Revolution. And, uh, you know, the expectation was that the Iranian Revolution uh, would be a warning to all other dictatorial regimes in the region and beyond. But unfortunately, the Iranian Revolution didn't take the direction which was supposed to take. And the result was that actually it uh, sent the wrong message to the uh, authoritarian regimes in the region and said that, look, if uh, you have a revolution or an uprising, it could result in a theocracy like the one which is taking place. And of course, uh, in Iran. And of course, uh, uh, quite a number of uh, regimes drew on that very heavily. Now, the, the Tunisian revolution and the Egyptian revolution, uh, we, it will all really depend on what direction they're going to take. If they do really lead down the path of democratic development in these societies, then obviously that will be a very, very clear warning to all other dictatorial regimes or authoritarian regimes in the region. Either they have to uh, open their fists or they are going to face the same sort of popular discontent as Mubarak uh, has faced and as Ben Ali has faced in, in, uh, in uh, Tunisia. So it, 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 it will, I mean, as I said, the Egyptian situation is very fluid at this stage. I mean, there are possibilities of different scenarios. But my hope is that it will result in a democratic transformation of Egypt. And that will also assist other countries in the region to uh, embark on a process of reformation. I mean, of course, the process is never going to be easy, never going to be free of pain, never going to be free of violence. But a start has to be made. And it, to me, it appears that the Tunisians and the Egyptians have made that start but where is it going to really lead? I think that's something that Professor Bauker will answer in another public lecture from our center, hopefully in a few weeks' time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Saiga. Um, and, and the third scenario, you mentioned the, the current situation of the policy, the crisis between governments and the people uh, continues. Uh, it will benefit the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, can you explain how and what will just uh, 
Uh, well, I mean, the crisis goes on. Uh, that could uh, will not only result in a uh, deterioration of the econ economic situation, but also possibly the weakening and the disintegration of the state institutions which have held Egypt together. And uh, that could result in a, a development of a chaotic situation, whereby then our united force uh, with a very radical ideology uh, could come into play, and that is you know, a, a faction of the Muslim Brotherhood, and therefore promise the people what they want to hear, like as, the, uh, as was the case with the Bolshevik Revolution. Of course, it was not a revolution. It was a coup d'etat, you know, the Bolshevik coup d'etat. But it was Lenin in his uh, uh, cohorts who played a very important role in terms of telling the people what they wanted to hear, which was, you know, peace, bread, and land. And that really uh, uh, went down extremely well. And here is v Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who didn't have much support inside Russia before that, suddenly comes and from, from abroad uh, with, the, with the help of the uh, German money and take over uh, the, the Russia and declares a revolution from the above. You know, that's, that's, uh, I, that is always that danger. Yes, uh, and, and, and I see that risk in relation to the Egyptian situation as well. And that's why I think it's important that the crisis is resolved quicker and uh, uh, more uh, wisely uh, rather than letting it on go on for some time. Uh, even one of the, one of the, one of the uh, factors which really helped uh, Khomeini and his supporters in Iran because the revolution went on for too long. It started at the end of 1977 and uh, in a way sort of finished with the Shah's departure on the 17th of January 1979. And, it, and, and, and of course, the, 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 then uh, the revolution took its own life in a different direction and so on. But uh, I think the longer it goes on, uh, the more there is the risk of a power vacuum. And that power vacuum could be filled by a, a, a radical group with a sort of uh, the kind of agenda that people uh, uh, are looking for. I want to go back to the first question about the Egyptian army. From what you know of the makeup of the army, people involved, perhaps especially the people at the top, to what extent are they, do you think there's a, a commitment to follow a, a truly democratic program, uh, or might it, as against the other option where you get some. Uh, um, power, power, crazy guys who want to just pursue the same sort of line under a different uh, headline. Different. I don't know. I don't know a great deal, a great deal about the Egyptian uh, military, um, but I would expect the top echelons of the military to remain for the time being loyal to the regime because they have a vested interest in the regime. Um, whether the conscript soldiers at the end will display the same degree of loyalty, that remains to be, so, uh, remains to be uh, seen. But one must not really forget that when the free officers under the leadership of Jamal Abdel Nasser uh, staged a coup d'etat in 1952 and overthrew the pro-British monarchy and declared Egypt an Arab Nationalist Republic, um, the, the, Nasser in his uh, uh, cohorts also promised uh, genuine democracy. Uh, but that's not what really tra transpired. Uh, 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 by, the, uh, by the nature of their military background, it is not easy for a, 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 a general uh, to uh, move down the path of democratization that easily. I mean, we know that uh, President uh, uh, Parviz Musharraf of Pakistan, when he seized power in 1999, he promised that he was going to lead, each, uh, the, uh, he is going to deliver uh, Pakistan genuine democracy. But we know that to the very end, he remained a military dictator. So I don't, I don't trust that the military figures to take over the government and to transform the system into a democratic system. Because they're just simply not really trained and 
psychologically built up for it. Um, yes, please. You keep mentioning uh, several times about um, the longer the crisis goes on, there may be additional complications. What can who do? What should not be done to, to help the situation come to a resolution that the Egyptian people want sooner, faster, and better for the Egyptian people. I'm not advocating any external intervention, yet I'm sure external diplomacy, when done properly, might help or hinder things. What, what are some of those variables? Well, I personally think that if uh, Vice President uh, Omar Suleiman has the interest of Egypt at heart, and if, if he does, and he really wants to uh, do a big service for the Egyptian people, then he is in a position to play an important role in opening the way for democratic changes in Egypt. I'm not saying for a minute that he's not limited by people who are around him. Of course, they are, he, like uh, President Mubarak himself, uh, uh, is surrounded by a number of political entrepreneurs and economic entrepreneurs that they would like to really see the current system uh, retaining uh, itself, uh, perhaps in a different form, but, the, but, but would not really change at the core. I mean, that's the, that's the whole thing that they would like to do. But, but you have to really balance that against whether Suleiman, and for that matter, some of the people around him, they really think of the future of Egypt. What is really at stake is the future of Egypt. Um, the, outside, the outside world, yes, they can play a role. And as I've pointed out, perhaps uh, President uh, Obama's support of the democratic forces, something which uh, President Carter couldn't do it in the case of Iran. President, uh, President Obama uh, could, could play an important role. But that also means that President Obama, in the wake of this, will have to somehow uh, modify the nature of this strategic partnership which has existed between the United States and Israel. If that does not change, and if you have democracy in Egypt, and you have democracy in Tunisia, and you've got democracy throughout the Arab world, but the nature of that strategic partnership does not change, then you're still not going to really solve one of the important problems in the region, which has become the source of all other problems in the, in the area. And that <coughs> is the Palestinian, the Palestinian problem. So I think, but, but one thing which I think the democratization of the Arab world could do, that, that is that it could weaken the position of Israel by pulling the rag from under the feet of Israel. Because so far Israel prides itself on being the only democracy in the region. And therefore taking the, moral, uh, the higher moral grounds all the time in its relations with uh, its neighbors and in, relations, uh, and in its relations with the Palestinians. Uh, but uh, I mean, I do recall that I was at a, a Digital Foundation conference uh, on the Middle East a few years ago. And uh, we were finishing, and Sir, Sir Jeffrey Howe was uh, chairing uh, the, the conference. So it was just a very small uh, gathering. And uh, we had the final plenary session. And uh, it was uh, the, head of the, the former head of the Israeli intelligence, uh, uh, that's the, the Mossad, uh, 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 Mr. Gimpy, uh, got up and said, oh, this is just about 10 minutes before the plenary session, the final plenary session uh, uh, was about to end. That he said, uh, oh, Sir Jeffrey, um, you, you know, um, the, we are always come under pressure from the international community to do something with our neighbors and to negotiate with our neighbors. He said, but we are the only democracy. We are the only democracy in the region. How could we possibly negotiate with these dictatorships around us? How could we possibly do that? I, and there was, after that, there was a silence. At which point I raised my hand as the most, perhaps insignificant, member of the gathering. <laughs> and, it, and Sir Jeffrey Howe said, we've got seven minutes, you don't have to take the whole time. And it's been fine. And, and, my, and my point was, was, whenever we have an international gathering and we are giving serious thinking of how to really, the, the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, problem can be resolved, the representative of the uh, State of Israel pours a cold water on it. 
I mean, you know, this, uh, if you're going to wait for uh, the Arab world to become as democratic as Israel sees itself to be, then it's going to take a very long time. So that means that we're, we're, going, to, we're going to stay in a state of conflict. So, I, I mean, any measure of democratization in the Middle East can actually help um, not only uh, the Arabs to claim the higher moral grounds, but also we will help an administration like that of Obama to become more proactive in finding a resolution, securing a resolution to one of the most central problems and fundamental problems in the region, and that is the Palestinian problem. I'm sorry, no. No. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, thank you, Professor. Is Egypt on the Arab world really ready for democracies? Uh, it strikes me that there's been no history of democracy, no public culture, there's no, there's no cultural memory. Uh, does this cry for democracy come from an, a thin layer of educated elite and the average Arab or average Egyptian doesn't really understand it? Or is, it, is there some groundswell which goes deep down into, into the less educated masses? Well, the way I see it, that is a central issue. I mean, that is, that is very important. I mean, it is true that Egypt does not have a history of democracy, does not have the necessary institutions to provide the uh, immediate foundations for a democratic transformation uh, of Egypt. But then again, the Egyptians will have to start from somewhere, don't they? Just simply because they don't have it at the moment. That means that the will have to languish within an authoritarian environment forever. So I think a mo at least a movement has begun. And I think, in the way I see it, it is important for the international community to support that movement and not to let it fail. Because if it fails, then yes, Egypt will remain and what it's been experiencing for decades and possibly centuries. How deep is this democratic way in Egyptian society? Well, at this stage, to me it appears that while it may not be very deep, but it is important to remember that history and politics are often shaped not by the masses, but by, the indivi by, but by individuals and groups. I do not recall any ins historical instance where the masses have played a critical role in shaping a society. The direction, the politics of that society. Probably the most genuine mass revolution that you had in the modern times was the Iranian revolution. But look what happened. It was not really the masses at the end who shaped Iranian politics and Iranian future direction. But rather it was an elite. But the same is really true. I mean, in the case of many other countries. Look at India and the Gandhi. It was Gandhi in his cohorts which influenced Indian politics and the transformation of India. Not necessarily the Indian masses. And there are many other instances that we could really look at it. I mean, we could look at it. I mean, look at the case of Algeria, and again, independence from France. There was a genuine mass movement there for independence under the leadership of Ben Bella. But who did we end up with? Hawari Bamudian, a military man who took over and basically established a dictatorship. They, he was the one who really shaped the Algerian politics and the political direction. Not necessarily the masses who participated and made sacrifices in gaining independence for Algeria. Okay, 